So, um, a guy comes to his mother and he says, Mother, after 40 years, I finally decided to get married. And the mother is so happy and she said, I would love to meet your future wife. He said, how about Friday night for dinner? The mother said, great. And then, and then the guy said, you know, mother, in the last four years, I dated three other women. Why don't I bring all of them for dinner and let's see if you can guess which is the one I'm going to marry. The mother is excited, the guy is excited, Friday night dinner, he shows up with four women and the mother starts talking to them. She talked to the first, the second, the third, the fourth. She goes back and forth, back and forth for an hour. At the end of the hour, she points to one of them and says, this is the one, this is the one you're going to marry. And the guy is just shocked. He said, mother, how well you know me. How well you understand me. He said, I love all of these women. I respect all of them. I care a lot about all of them. I'm friends with all of them. But this is indeed the one, this is the one I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. He said, what gave it away? What was the, the skill, the attribute, the characteristic that made it clear to you this is the one? So the mother looks at him and she says, it's the only one I hate. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about emotions and how emotions get in the way. Um, so there's lots of things in life that we kind of know what's the right thing to do, but we don't behave in the appropriate way. And these are called self-control problems. Something where something is good in principle, but not right now. And to get us started thinking about this, uh, I want you to reflect about your own lives a little bit. So uh, how many people in this room, for example, in the last month have eaten more than you think you should? Just kind of general. OK. How many of you in the last month have exercised less than you think you should? OK. How many of you in the last month, and please be honest, have texted while driving? And just to be clear, we include when it's in a red light and you're just starting to move. That, that's include uh, texting and driving. OK. Uh, how many of you in the last month have left the bathroom at least once without washing your hands? <laughs> By the way, oh, this, uh, the, a little bit of honesty here in the front. Nice. Um, <laughs> this, by the way, is a really interesting question because you know, we know from uh, looking at hospitals that doctors don't always wash their hands. So the odds that almost all of you wash your hands all the time is very unlikely. And you just admitted texting and driving, which one is the most stupid things uh, you could do. But admitting that you don't always wash your hands, that's a little tougher. Last question. How many of you have ever had unplanned, unprotected sex? <laughs> Somebody's proud in the back. Um, now, if you think about all of those problems, they all have the same characteristic. And the characteristic is that there's something that we know is the right thing to do in principle, but at the moment, we don't feel like it. So think about a very general case. Imagine I offer you some chocolates, and I had the, the most amazing box of chocolate. And I said, what would you rather have? A one pound of this amazing chocolate in a week or half a pound right now? A pound in a week or half a pound right now, and I would pass the chocolate around, and you could see it, and you could smell it. It was just here. What would happen? In those cases, almost everybody says, give me the half a box of chocolate right now. It's not worthwhile to wait another week for another half a pound of chocolate. But what would happen if we push the choice to the future? What if instead of saying now versus a week, I would say, what would you rather have? A half a box of chocolate in a year or a full box of chocolate in a year in a week? Now it's the same question. It's at the same discount rate. It's asking you whether you're willing to wait another week for another half a box of chocolate. But when you ask the question this way, between a year and a year and a week, now everybody is patient. Right? Why? Because in the future, we are wonderful people. <laughs> we will exercise. We will not text and drive. We will eat well. I mean, everything in the future will be fantastic. The problem is with the present. 
Think about texting and driving. In principle, you all know that it's a stupid thing to do. It's not as if I can add any more piece of information and you say, oh, I had no idea. Now that I know that this is a stupid thing to do, let me just stop. No, we know it's a stupid thing to do. We start driving thinking we're not going to text and drive, but then what happens? Our phone vibrates. And the moment our phone vibrates, we become slightly different people. And we become slightly different people that think differently about the consequences and the outcomes. We think more about our curiosity about what it is exactly that is coming from our phone right now, and we act in very undesirable ways. And the sad reality is those temptations are getting larger and larger, and they're killing us. There was an analysis that asked the question, what is the percentage of human mortality that is either caused by or aided by bad decisions? Right? Think about how often can you make a bad decision that would translate into an accelerated death. And they estimated that about 100 years ago, it was about 10%. Think about 100 years ago, how could you make a decision that would lead to an early mortality? Now it's more than 40%. How come? What happened? As we invent new technologies, we also invent new ways to kill ourselves. Right? <laughs> Obesity, diabetes, smoking, texting and driving. Many of those things are not things that you do one time and could kill you, but a long sequence of those behaviors could accelerate our death. So this is the problem of self-control. This is the problem of now versus later, and it's everywhere. And by the way, it's not all, only everywhere, it's getting worse. Why? One of the principles in behavioral economics is that the environment matters, that we make decisions in the fun as a function of the environment around us. And what is the environment around us trying to achieve? Are they trying to achieve our long-term well-being? Or are they trying to achieve their short-term well-being? Think about Dunkin' Donuts. What is their objective? To get you to be healthy in 30 years from now? No, it's to get it, eat one more donut today. What is the goal of Facebook? To get you to be a productive citizen in 20 years or to check Facebook twice more today? All the entities around us, actually almost all of them, want us to do something now that is good for these other entities, not necessarily in our long-term best interest, and they're getting better at it, and we're getting tempted more and more and more. So what can we do? What can we do uh, in order to fight temptation? And I want to present to you two starting principles about temptation to just get us thinking about it. So the first one is something we call reward substitution. And reward substitution, it's a little bit like gamification, which I'm sure you, you, you know the term. And, and I'll tell you a personal story about this. So as you can see, I was, I was burned when I was uh, 18. I was uh, in hospital for about three, three years. And one of the things I got in hospital was a liver disease. I got a liver disease at the time. They didn't know what it was. They just knew I had a liver infection. And it would come up, and it would disappear, and, and so on for years. And fast forward quite a few years, I'm already in grad school, I had another uh, liver infection, I checked myself into hospital, and they tell me that I have hepatitis C. And at that time, the FDA was running a test to see whether a medication called interferon was going to help cure hepatitis C. Um, and they asked me if I want to join the, the protocol to, to try this interferon, and I said, what happened if I don't? And they described to me how it feels like to die from liver cirrhosis. So I joined the protocol. <laughs> and the thing with that protocol is that interferon is a very unpleasant medication. Lots of side effects, headache, shaking, vomiting, fever, stuff like that. Not as bad as dying from liver cirrhosis by immediately and tonight. So imagine you came home from work and you open the refrigerator and you have these injections and you know that if you inject yourself, you'll have a miserable night, but you also know that if you'll inject yourself three times a week for a year and a half, you might not have liver cirrhosis in 30 years. And that's the trade-off. Anyway, I took the medications. A year and a half later, they did another liver biopsy. I beat the disease. That was good news. Uh, there are more better medications out there now on the market, much more expensive, but also much better. 
But my doctor, Dr. Killenberg, told me I was the only patient in the protocol that took the medication on time. The question is, how come? Uh, do I like my liver more than other people like theirs? Um, am I less irrational? Do I think differently about the future? The answer is none of those. The answer is that I re-engineer my environment to change my incentives. What I did was that I had a deal with myself. My deal was based on the fact that I love movies. If I had time, I would watch lots of movies. I don't have that much time. I don't watch that many movies. But on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which were injection days, first thing in the morning, I would go to a video store. I would rent some videos I really wanted to watch. I would, I would carry them in my backpack the whole day. I would come back from school. I would put the video in. I would inject myself, and I would press play. I did not wait for the side effects to start. I connected something I did not want, the injection, with something I wanted, which was the movies. Now, if you think about it, it's, a, it's kind of a strange story. Because if you ask me what's more important, movies or liver, the liver is clearly much more important. I would give up all movies in the world uh, for a healthier liver. But that's not the time consequences of these effects. The effect of the liver was going to be way, way in the future, maybe in 20 years, maybe in 30 years, where the movies were right now. So did I think differently about my liver? No. But I did something that by acting in a way that was good for me right now, which meant watching the movies, I also got something that was good for me for the future. And that's the principle of reward substitution. We take something that we should care about, but we don't, and we connect it to something else that would give us some reward in the present. So think about something like global warming. Can we get people to truly care about global warming? Very hard. In fact, if you went about it the other way, and you say, let's find the one problem in the world that would maximize human apathy, you would come up with global warming. Long in the future, will happen to other people first. We don't see it progressing. We don't see anybody particularly suffering. Anything we would do is a drop in the bucket. Can you get people to truly care? Few people in Berkeley, that's about it. <laughs> but can we come up with reward substitution? Can we say that's too long in the future? Can we get people to get the reward now from doing something that is consistent with being good for the future. Electrical cars are like that, right? Uh, this is an unscientific observation, but when I see people driving electrical cars, they seem to me that they smile more than other people. And I think it's because they're basically saying to themselves, look at me, I'm a great, kind human being. And other people can see me and can see what a wonderful, kind human being I am. <laughs> and they basically project their view of how wonderful they are on the rest of us by driving electrical vehicle, wonderful thing to do. I'm not saying they're not wonderful human beings, but they take advantage of this public aspect of electrical vehicles, and they basically get another part of ego from this. I'll give you one more, one more example. There's a medication called Cumidin. Cumidin is a, an anti-stroke medication. It's a relatively good anti-stroke medication, and it reduces the chance of a second stroke from about 24% to about 4%. Quite good. And you would think that people who had a stroke will take Humidin on time every time because they don't want a second stroke. Compliance rate is very low. How can we use reward substitution to try and get people to take their medication on time? So there's a new technology called internet-enabled pill boxes. These are pill boxes that are connected online, and every time somebody takes their pill, we know about it. So what can we do? Reward substitution needs two things. We need to measure what people are doing, and then we need to either reward good behavior or punish bad behavior. The internet-enabled pill boxes allow us to measure what people are doing. And now we can either reward them or punish them. Um, just for fun, what kind of rewards or punishments would you try? Anybody, raise your hand. Uh, badges, for badges for doing it right. Very good, what else? Sorry? Chocolate. Chocolate, very good. Chocolate covered pills. What else? Social media biscuits. Social media biscuits. Not sure what this is, but uh, let's, let's assume it's good. What else? Yeah. 
Money, pay people. Yeah. Okay, guilt. <laughs> Very good. The, the usual question for this is Jewish or Catholic? A ride in electric car, some, some else. Very good. So we, I'll tell you about what we've tried. So we, we, uh, one of the easiest things to try is money, of course. So we tried money. What do you think happens um, if you give people $3 a day to take the medication on time? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. What would happen if we gave them $1,000 a day? Well, we didn't try this. Um, <laughs> But yes, you know, with enough money, you can buy people, but we don't have enough money. So the question is, can we take $3 and make it feel larger? So the first thing we tried was to lose the, use the principle called loss aversion. Loss aversion is the idea that people hate losing much more than they enjoy gaining. So we said, what if we took money away from people instead of giving them? That works much nicer. But there's an even nicer approach. And that nicer approach is built on two principles. The first one is lotteries. If I gave you $3 a day, that's not very exciting. If I gave you 10% chance of making $30, that's more exciting. But it's even more exciting to take lotteries and add regret to it. Now let's think about regret. What is regret? Regret is a really interesting psychological finding. Regret is about the fact that our happiness is not driven by where we are, it's driven by a contrast between where we are and where we think we could have been. And if we think we could have been somewhere happier, we're miserable. And if we think we could have been somewhere worse, we're happy. It's about this contrast. For example, when would you be more unhappy? If you missed your flight by two minutes or by two hours? Two minutes, why? You're stuck in the same airport with the same bad food. Why is the two minutes so much worse? Because you can imagine. You can imagine a world in which you would have made it. And you say to yourself, if the person in line in front of me understood what no liquids mean. <laughs> if the TSA agent had one more IQ point. I'm sorry, I fly a lot. Um, <laughs> and, and you basically can imagine the many ways in which you would have made it. And you see that plane leaving as you're kind of by the gate, and you imagine that you were there. And if, you're, if you missed it by two hours, you can't imagine what if. There was, a, there was a really nice study a few years ago in the Olympics. They took pictures of people who won medals, and they analyzed how big was their smile. What would you think? People expect gold, silver, bronze. No, gold, bronze, silver. Why is the silver person the least happy? This close, right? Imagine for four years you got up extra early and every morning you did whatever you do and 90 seconds ago you got second place. What's the thought you can't help but having? If only, if only. And what is the bronze person thinking? At least I'm here, <laughs> look at everybody else. And, and you can probably think about many cases in your own lives in which your own happiness is not driven by actually where you are, but driven by some contrast. Contrast to your neighbors, to, to people at work, all kinds of contrast rather than your actual state. So this is regret, this contrast. How do you bring regret to our experiment? So imagine all of you are on Coumadin and all of you are taking your supposed to take your medication, People on my right are taking the medication, people on the left are not. If we just do the regular lottery, I take the people who've taken the medication, take 10% of you, and give you the reward. If I try to add regret, I give everybody a lottery ticket, whether you took the medication or not. And I call you up and I say, congratulations, you're the winner of the coveted lottery. The stars are smiling on you, it's your lucky day, sadly. I see you did not take your pill today, so you're not getting the money. That's the essence of regret, because now you can think about the small act you could have taken earlier in the day that would put you in a def very different situation. And with those two things, lotteries and regret, compliance rate goes from about 65% to about 98%. 
So when you think about self-control, there's lots of sad things because we see people acting, we all, all acting in a way that is not in our long-term best interest. But it doesn't mean we have to give up. We can actually make things better. We can change the environment in reward substitution. We can add some money, we can add regret, we can add guilt, we can add chocolate. There's all kinds of things we can do to get people to act now in a way that is in our long-term best interest. Another mechanism I want to tell you about is called Ulysses contracts. You remember the story from the mythology. Ulysses knew that if the sirens will come, he will divert the boat and kill himself and the sailors. So what did he do? He asked the sailors to tie him to the mast. This way he could hear the call of the sirens, but he couldn't act on it. And he asked the sailors to put wax in their ears. And this way the sailors themselves could not hear the call of the sirens. They were unaware that temptation exists. Those two mechanisms are different, right? Because what are they? There are mechanisms that say, I know that my future self is likely to be tempted, and I want to do something now that will prevent my future self from being tempted. Right? I want to tie my, my hands to the mast. So again, let me ask you to reflect for a second. Anybody here can think about a case in which you've implemented the reward uh, a Ulysses contract, a case in which you try to force your future self to behave better? Putting your phone in a glove box the moment you get into the car. And you can think about two versions of this. One version is when the ringer is still on. So like Ulysses, you, you can hear the call of the sirens, but you can't act. And the other one is you turn it off, so you're like the sailors, you're unaware the temptation is coming. Anybody else? Yeah. Sleep in your gym clothes. Hopefully um, before. before, yeah, yeah, go, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Uh, very good. So you're dressed already. You're reducing, reducing friction for that. What else? Yeah. Not going to the clothing store. Not going to the clothing store. Yeah. And um, how many of you, for example, when you go to a supermarket, decide not to buy chocolate cake? Right. You can say, "Let me buy chocolate cake. I'll put it in the refrigerator. And I'll leave a slight, a small slice every other day." Or you could say, "Not going to happen." Um, yeah. Paying with cash, actually, I have uh, lots of research on this. Catch me after the, uh, the talk. It's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, people feel the pain of paying. You feel differently the agony of paying if you pay with credit card with cash, which changes, changes behavior. Um, I'll, give you one, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples for this. One, uh, one of them is we, we did this study in the medical domain again. Uh, it turns out in the history of the world, uh, nobody, nobody, nobody has ever woken up and said, today I feel like colonoscopy. <laughs> so what happens when you schedule for people colonoscopy? Uh, they make up stuff and they don't show up. So we ask people, we say, would you like to give us a check? When we schedule colonoscopies for people, we ask them, would you like to give us a check for $500? And if you'll show up on time, you'll get your money back. But if you're late for whatever reason, you lose the money. That's a bad deal, right? Because you can't get money back. You can only lose. But more than 50% of the people take us on this offer, and they show up for colonoscopy on time, right? Sometimes we recognize that our future self might fail, and we're doing all kinds of things to force that future self to behave better. Uh, when I was at, at MIT, the, one of the, the students in the lab um, did a clock called Clocky. Um, now, what happens when you have, uh, and Clocky is a clock with two big wheels that run in slightly different speeds. Now, what happens usually? You go to sleep, and you say to yourself, I'm the kind of person who will wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go for a run. And you set up your clock for 6 in the morning, and then 6 o'clock in the morning comes around, and you are no longer that person. A slightly different person, different preferences, different priorities. And if you have a regular clock, you uh, hit on it, and it goes to sleep, snooze, and so on. If you have clocky, the clocky is now running around the room in an unpredictable way. And you have to get up and chase it and find it. And by the time you find clocky, you're awake. And now you might as well go for a run. 
By the way, the fatal flaw of the first version of Clocky uh, was that by the time people found Clocky, they were also pissed off. <laughs> So if you'll do an image search, you'll see lots of people of clockies with the wheels torn off, which, of course, <coughs> makes it less. So if you think about temptation in general, it, it's really everywhere. It's really everywhere. And, and we can say, oh, let's just teach people to fight temptation. That's going to be very, very hard to do. You know, temptation builds on emotion. Our emotions get evoked by all kinds of things. And when our emotions get evoked, we kind of follow. Um, but because of that, it's incredibly important to figure out how do we design the world? How do we design the world in a way that would not get us to fail in the same, in the same ways? And, and I, I want to give you one story about that, that uh, something that we've implemented in terms of financial spending. Um, so, so this project, this study, we did in a slum called Kibera. Kibera is a slum in Kenya. Uh, these were people who live on about $10 a week, very, very poor people. And we wanted those people to save. And we didn't want them to save because we thought they would have money for retirement. Uh, we wanted them to save because when poor people run into negative financial shocks, they have to borrow money, and they borrow money at very high interest rates. So here's what happens. Um, let's say you live in Kibera, and you have a goat, and your goat gives you 25% of your income. And one day your goat is sick. You already live hand to mouth. You have no place to, uh, you, you have no cushion, um, and now you have to borrow. In Kibera, you borrow at about 10% interest a week, a week. And let's say that four weeks later, your goat is healthy again. Good news but still you're four weeks behind plus interest rate. How do you get out of it? Very, very hard to get out of it. So we wanted people to save a little bit of money for a rainy day. Now what would happen if we gave people a saving account in the front pocket of their pants? They would spend it. They would spend on good things, right? Um, water, fruit, more food. I mean, lots of things to spend, even, even in Kibera. So we wanted the money in the same way that we talked about self-control, to be out of reach. So we teamed up with M-Pesa, the, the payment, uh, Safaricom's electronic payment uh, company, and we investment bank. And we created a system where people could text money into their account, but every night the investment bank will take the money from the M-Pesa account and put it in the stock market. And you can argue about the logic of putting money in the Kenyan uh, stock market, but you know, that's what we did. Um, now, this system, what happened was it was very easy to text money in, very hard to get it out. Because to get it out, you couldn't text it out. You had to take a bus, go to the city, fill a piece of paper, wait an hour, get the money, and take the bus back. Maybe it will take four or five hours. And we did this intentionally because we wanted a system that is easy to put the money in and hard to get it out. OK, so we gave that system to lots and lots and lots of people. And then in addition to having this system, we had all kinds of conditions, all kinds of ways to try and encourage people to save money. So some people just got that system, what we call the control condition. Some people got that system plus a weekly text that said, try to save 100 shillings, about 90 cents this week. Another group got the same text message, but it was framed as if it came from their kids. So we knew the name of their kids, and we say, hi, mom, hi, dad, Did, this is little Johnny, whatever the name of the kid was, try and save 100 shillings this week. We had another group that we gave them a 10% match. We say, save up to 100 shillings, we'll give you 10% match. Another group got a 20% match. Two other groups also got 10% match and 20% match, but they got what we call pre-matching. I mentioned before loss aversion, the idea that people hate losing more than they enjoy gaining. So in the regular match, people save, and then we match at the end of the week. In the pre-matching condition, we gave them the match in the beginning of the week. And we said, if you save, you get to keep it. If you don't, we take it back. And we thought that taking it back would get people to be quite miserable, and very quickly they would save more. And we had another condition which we made a coin about this size, 
and it had 24 numbers etched on the edges. And we said, please put this coin somewhere visible in your hut. And then we said, every week, please take a knife and scratch the number for that week if you saved. That was it. So think about all of those methods. Text, text from kids, 10% at the end of the week, 20% at the end of the week, 10% at the beginning of the week, 20% at the beginning of the week, and the coin. Which one do you think worked the best? Let's get a vote, and I, this is not a political election. You have to vote here. <laughs> How many people think that the plain text worked the best? Plain text. One. OK. Uh, how many think that, by the way, just adding a plain text helped at all compared to nothing? Absolutely. Reminding people helped. How many people think that text from the kids work the best? Text from the kids. OK. 10% um, at the end of the week? 20% at the end of the week? 10% at the beginning of the week? 20% at the beginning of the week? How many people think the coin worked the best? OK, here are the results. Giving this system to people without reminders already created substantial savings. Reminder once a week helps. 10% at the end of the week helps some more. 20% at the end of the week, just like 10%. No difference. 10% at the beginning of the week helped some more. 20% at the beginning of the week, just like the 10%. And kids, by the way, were just like 10 and 20% plus loss aversion. So, you know, it's kind of powerful from a kid's perspective, right? That, that just a reminder from kids is just like having 10 or 20% plus loss aversion. But the coin was the big surprise for us. And the coin was the big surprise because it doubled savings compared to everything else. And the question is why? Now, I see some of you nodding. Um, you know, we call our uh, research center at Duke, we call it the Center for Advanced Hindsight. And um, <laughs> it's a little harder to get grants this way, but, but it's a, we use, we use this name because, you know, after the fact, you can always tell yourself a story about why you actually always anticipated these results, but we're trying to remind ourselves that we don't always predict these results. But, but now that we know the results, why do you think it happened? What's, what's the cause for this? Involvement, Involvement is one theory. People actually scratching. What else? See progress. By the way, we, we really try to kind of get the coins back. People love those coins. We couldn't get them back. So, so we, we had a hard time there. What else? The librarian just happened to keep the series on. OK, so like uh, you want to see uh, streaks. You want to see streaks. Again, we wanted to look at this. We couldn't. What else? The pleasure of checking something else, yeah. And other thoughts? Yeah. Other people can see. Now, it's, that's interesting. In Kibera, by the way, it's not as if people invite neighbors to their huts that much, but there is the family. And then somebody behind there. Was literally the same thought. OK, great. Um, OK, so let me tell you about another study. What do you think happens? If you randomly open to kids college savings account on the day that they are born, you take a group of kids, randomly assign some of them to get college savings account, some of them not, and you put $500 in their savings accounts. What do you think happened to these kids at age four? The results show that the kids with college savings account have higher social and cognitive skills. How can that be? Do you think that call a Four-year-old kids know that they have college savings accounts? No, their parents know. And once a month, their parents get a statement that says, this little kid, while still in diapers, has a college savings account. account. And it's true that it's less than $500 or about $500, but it doesn't matter because it's not about the amount of money. It's about the framing. And what happens? The parents treat the kids a bit better, they read to them a bit more. And you don't have to do a lot if you think about four years. Uh, we were just able to convince actually quite a few places now. San Francisco is doing it, the Israeli government is doing it, the state of Maine is likely to do it. Lots of places are taking these results and opening 
uh, college savings accounts to kids on the day that they are born, again from a mindset perspective. So let's go back to our experiment. If you think about the days of the week, we texted everybody on Thursday to save. And indeed, people saved on Thursday. The benefit of the coin did not come from Thursday. It came from all the other days of the week. Why? Because the coin was something visible in the environment. And from time to time, people saw it. And from time to time, people thought about savings. And from time to time, they took an action. We react to our environment. We make decisions as a function of the, the environment that we're in. In your environment, what reminds you about savings? Nothing. Everything that you see reminds you about what? Spending. The same thing is true in Kibera. Nothing about their environment reminds them about saving. All of a sudden, we create something. Did they think about it all the time? No. Did they think about it every day? Of course not. But for time to time, we thought about it. They thought about it. And there's, there's actually an interesting point here about thinking about the digital world. Think about apps. When do you think about an app? You can think about it when it notifies you of something, unless you turn it off. But unless, you've, unless you have notification, you think about an app only when you think about an app. It has to come from the inside. Whereas the physical environment has another possibility, which is to basically create thoughts in us. And there's lots of opportunities like that. So what is the, the overall point I want to say? The world is actually very tough. And the world is getting tougher and tougher to make decisions about. It's harder to make decisions about our long-term financial well-being. It's harder to make decisions about our health. Everything is more complex, uh, more difficult. Temptation is increasing. And I think the key to human freedom is not about empowering people with necessarily more reasoning at each point, but it's about helping us create a different environment. If I came to your office every morning and I layered your desk with donuts, how healthy would you be at the end of that year? Certainly less healthy. You don't have to fail every day. You don't have to fail every time. But if we design the environment this way, you would certainly fail, and certainly life will be worse off. The point is we don't have to design life like this. We can design things to be, to be better. We can actually design things to be more, uh, <coughs> more in line with our human skills. And I'll give you one last example based on your question earlier. <coughs> so there's the principle we call the pain of paying. And the pain of paying is the idea that we, when we think about payment, as we pay, we enjoy things less. So if you go out to dinner today, and it's an expensive meal, it's $200, and you pay with either cash or credit card, the cash would feel much worse. And it would feel much worse because you see the money leaving your account. Imagine I owned a restaurant, and I figured out that people eat 50 bites and pay $50. And I came to you and I said, because you're such a wonderful person, I'll cut your cost in half. I'll charge you 50 cents per bite. And not only that, I'll charge you only for the bites you eat. The bites you don't eat, you don't need to pay. And I'll serve you your dish. I'll step back and I'll mark a check every time you take a bite. How much fun will that meal be? It'll be miserable. When I teach my students about the psychology of money, I bring pizza and I charge them 25 cents per bite. What do you think happened? Huge bites. Huge bites. <laughs> and, and they take such huge bites that they suffer from the whole thing. <laughs> now think about where we go with technology. We have Apple Pay. We have Android Pay. Are we minimizing the pain of paying? We certainly are. It's as if we're imagining that the right world to drive toward is a world in which people don't think about money at all when they consume. That's actually not a good choice if you think about people's long-term well-being. So I think we do need to think about, for example, the decision of electronic wallet. What kind of electronic wallet do we want to create? 
Do we want to create one that would tap into our instincts and get us to not think about the future and get us to spend more? Or do we want to create something very different that will get us to think more about the future and maybe make better decisions? Um, thank you very much. <laughs>